This episode is sponsored by Lupton Capital, which provides a variety of investment services to both retail and institutional investors on platforms such as Seeking Alpha, Substack, and StockTwits. For more information on these services or for links to those services, please visit luptoncapital.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investing with the Whales podcast. My name is Jonah Lupton. I am your host. Uh, Another great guest today. This is a friend that goes back a few years. Please welcome Brian Shannon to the show. Brian, how are you? Good. How are you? How, hey, Good. everybody. Uh, some people might know Brian as Alpha Trends on Twitter, and he is also the author of this book, Anchored VWAP. And what we're going to do is once we post this interview on Twitter, uh, we're going to have everyone retweet it, and then we'll pick one of those people to win a free copy of the book. Uh, Brian, when did this book come out? It came out uh, mid-January, so just uh, two, you know, two and a half months ago. It's okay. still fresh. And this is your second book? It is. The first one I did in 2008. I forgot what a pain in the ass it is to write a book. <laughs> it took me 15 years to get back to it. Wow. Uh, when did you start working on this one? I probably started working on it about five years ago. Really? And, wow. you know, but but when I say work on it, I, you know, kind of had the concept, wrote a few notes down, left it alone for six months, went back to it, said, hey, I got to do some work on that. And then... You know, it really came to fruition basically uh, the last nine months of 2022 is when okay. I really jammed hard on it. When do you find a publisher, right? Is that what it's called? Uh, you have to find a publisher or someone and then someone to promote the book for you? Well, you know, that model is kind of broken, like so many models, you know. Actually, actually I, I look on the back and it says Alpha Trends Publishing. There you go. Right. So did, you, did you self-publish? I, it is. It's self-published. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I was saying is, you know, the the traditional model, you go through uh, one of the, the you know the top publishing companies for financial books. They'll give you a 10, 25 grand up front, something like that, and you'll basically never see an. A, you, you'll see very small amounts of you'll money. See, you'll see pennies pennies on the dollar, right? Yeah. So it, when you think about how much work it takes, you're really not. You know, I was told early on, you know, the 16, 17 years ago, if you're ever going to write a book, don't do it to make money. You want to do it kind of as a calling card, um, which I don't really believe in. I've 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 kind of tried to make that a hybrid model where. Uh, you know, it, it, I deserve to be compensated for the work I did on it, all the no- years of knowledge it took to get that and then to, you know, shake it out of my head in a concise way. So, um, you know, it's it's not going to make me or anybody rich, but it's it, it's enough to pay for itself. Uh, you know, I had a pretty big nut going into it, you know, close to six figures in terms of the printing, the editing, the cover design. Just the, you know the indexing. It's it's there's really a lot more pieces to it than people realize, and like I said, it was 15 years between the prior one. I kind of forgot, you know, what a pain <laughs> it is. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do another one. <laughs> you sound like me in the investment conferences. <laughs> too yeah, much, yeah. Too much work, and I didn't get compensated. I actually lost money on them. Uh, how much of the content in this book was also? I mean, because v, I feel like VWAPs. You know, when you did, you said the first book was 2008, right? Yep. I mean, were people even talking about VWAPs back then or was the, the book about something totally different? There, there was a little bit of uh, VWAP in that book that I that I did. So, I, you know, I was happy to, you know, have that as part of my VWAP legacy, I guess. Um, but but that was more about, you know, cyclical analysis. I mean, it was multiple technical analysis using multiple timeframes. So it's looking at the traditional stage analysis popularized by Stan Weinstein and taking that and looking at it on a weekly chart, a daily chart, an intraday chart, and trying to find that trend alignment, that perfect place uh, to buy a stock as it's just emerging into strength and hopefully, you know, on multiple time frames so you can hold it for a longer period of time. Okay. And this book was primarily all VWAPs? Yeah, so there's a little bit of catch up material. I'm sure you probably saw the appendix. And in the front, I say there's, th- you know, three sections to this book. Uh, one kind of the intro background about uh, the VWAP, the anchor VWAP, how it came to be, and how institutions use it and that sort of thing. The second is really kind of the meat of here's how you make money with this, which, you know, is a strategy. And the third section is the appendix, which I've got two appendices. And they are basically to just kind of catch up on some concepts that if you didn't read the first book, you're not going to be completely lost. 
And just for, you know, if some new person picks up this book, they're going to go VWAP. Well, why, why am I starting here? So go to the appendix first, familiar yourself with, you know, basic technical analysis to start and my own spin on some of those things, and then get into the meat of what the anchored VWAP is and how to use it to make more money and manage risk. I mean, a f- couple of years ago when I started using TrendSpider, you know, focused on lines, uh, moving averages, volume shelves, all of that stuff, and then start to use VWAPs. And now it feels like VWAPs are becoming more and more important. And, you know, right now, so like my trading strategy, I look for a lot of, uh, I'm trying to get into stocks right now that had big gap ups on Q4 earnings and yeah. now pulling back into their 50 day moving average. But as they, you know, as they bounce off the 50 or bounce off the 21 and try to move higher again, so often, like 80% of the time, they're getting rejected at the VWAP anchored at that recent high. Yeah. And like sometimes it's to the freaking penny. Yeah. Like that's not a coincidence. I mean, no, that's, it's not that's at because all. is that because the algorithms have are using that VWAP as well? Right. So I so I went in and, and I used the example from Ken Griffin when you know the uh, AMC and GME. You know, when he went before Congress and he said, you know, I, I listened to it and he said something like, you know, 85 or I, I think he said, forget it's in the book. I think like 93 percent of all of our orders are generated uh, via algorithms. And, you know, obviously their firm does more business than any other firm out there. And he was the most profitable hedge fund earner last year, he earned four point one billion dollars personally. So when he talks about their strategies, you got to you've got to listen. He said most of those orders are done through VWAP algorithms. So, you know, what I did, I spoke to various people who uh, have large institutional background uh, in terms of trading and how they trade. And, you know, a large institution will say, you know, we want to, you'll see, let's, let's say support for a stock. Let's say it gaps up and it starts to run a little bit after that earnings report, it pulls back and it comes right to that volume weighted average price and magically bounces from there. What happens is when a big institution wants to buy stock, as you know, they've got to buy two, three, five million shares, whatever it might be. They don't have the same luxury as us to just try to really you know, fine tune our, our, our entry. So they're trying to do like they might put an order in for the next month that says, I want to buy this stock as long as it you know, or in, or they'll go to their broker and say, guarantee me VWAP execution for the next month on these three million shares. So each day that institution says, okay, well, you know, let's say it's a million shares and we're going to do this order over 10 days. We'll do 100,000 shares per day. They, we're going to slice it that way. They might even go and say, well, Mondays it usually trades 23% of the volume for the week. So we'll do 23% of it on Monday, 23,000 shares. And Wednesday is 18%. So we'll do 18, you know, 18,000 shares. So the way they do that then each day is they take that, 20, let's say 25,000 shares. And they take that 25,000 shares on Monday and they say, I want to buy this stock as close to the daily volume weighted average price as possible. And they'll do that by saying, okay, in the first five minutes of the day, it trades 4% of the average daily volume. So that means we've got to buy a thousand of those 25,000 shares in that time bucket. And they take each time bucket and they just want to, you know, the, the VWAP was you know, defined early on or described early on as the price a naive trader could expect to get. So they're trying to be just average in their execution and not, you know, broadcast to the market that they're a large buyer by just going in and spraying the offer. Um, and they're, all, you know, so they don't want to have a large market impact cost. So they're trying to sneak their orders in undetected as a, you know, just a, a small percentage of the volume in each of those five minute buckets. It might be a 20 minute bucket, whatever they do, but that's the way they use. So the parent order is the 25,000 shares and the child order is those small orders that get executed in those five minute buckets or whatever it might be. So they're just trying to, you know, make sure that they don't have a market impact cost of their order. Now there's VWAPs, volume weighted average price, which you can pull up on a trend spider chart or probably other service charts, like a moving average. Right. And then there's anchored VWAPs, 
which right. are sort of a different animal. And that's where I'm, I typically use, you know, I use my, I use the SMA and the EMA for moving averages. Right. And then I use my anchored VWAPs from, you know, where the, basically like where the, the character change of the chart exactly. takes place, whether it was a big gap up, whether it was an earnings date, whether it was recent high, recent low, you know, start of the year, stuff like that. So talk to us about anchored VWAPs. How do you use them? Where are they most important when it comes to trading, risk management, uh, you know, buying stocks on pullbacks? Where should you anchor them to? And if you want, I can give you uh, screen sharing capabilities. So you can you can share your screen if you want, if it's easier to. OK, to, yeah. To let me right. just uh, get to my proper screen. But, um, you know, there, there, there's a lot there. Uh, I know. I know. I was like 15 questions in one. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm, I, that's that's fine. Um, I don't mind. Let me uh, do the share screen and go to this one right here. And that's so, the thing, I mean, every every year, every stock. I mean, you use you use VO apps in different ways. Yeah. Anchor yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I wrote a book, right? It's a, <laughs> it, there's, there's a lot there. Um, but, you know, briefly, Jonah, it's, it's, it's to measure. So the, the VWAP is for one day. It's, you know, that's where it was designed in 1988. Uh, then in 1993, a gentleman named Dr. Paul Levine started experimenting with it. And he's the one who actually developed the anchored VWAP. Oh, okay. He died in 1998. A lot of his work did as well. And it kind of went unnoticed. I started really kind of playing with it in 2003 um, on a, a software called um, Realtek. And they didn't have the anchoring ability. It wasn't actually, in, so I, I was able to hack it in a certain way, but it wasn't until 2015 when TC2000, which you see here, first sure. added it. And then the uh, Trend Spider added it about two years after that. And now they're all falling like dominoes, which is so great oh, yeah. to see there, you know, there's so many of them uh, doing it. So, you know, where to anchor from? One is, as you mentioned, where the character changes, uh, where there might've been a big catalyst in the stock. So what we're looking at here is a stock that I'm currently involved in, and that's MAXN, this is Max and Solar. Let's take a look first at the uh, weekly chart and here you can see on this weekly chart, you know, we've got a nice long base and in this long base, you can actually kind of say, you know, so you combine it with other technical analysis that could be called a, you know, inverted head and shoulders pattern, but whatever you want to call it, this is prior resistance in here. And then we had this big volume. Well, that big volume there where we saw this move, that was clear, clearly a character change for the stock. So when we look at the daily time frame here on the left, I've got a 20 day moving average of 50 and a 200. This uh, black shouldn't be there. That's from the, uh, th this should actually be, let me uh, put this over here. Um, this should be over here, which is January uh, 1st, uh, January 3rd, actually, the beginning of the year. So you can right. see that we had that big event. It pulled back right to the year to date anchored VWAP. We've got over here on the right, we've got the anchored volume weighted average price from that event where the psychology change, where the perception of value saw a rapid revaluation. Well, what we've seen since then is, you know, for the first couple of days, the buyers were quite aggressive getting involved in it. And then it broke below it. Now it's been above a little bit here and there, but it just broke back above today and the anchored VWAP from this level. I didn't buy the stock over here because it was extended, it had just gone from 22 and a half to 26 and a half. I just actually purchased this two days ago. I was a little bit early, but I added to it today. And now it's breaking above the anchored volume weighted average price from that earnings report. And we can just go here and put it on that daily chart and see that as well. So that is, you know, one, we had a, a large catalyst. So that catalyst in this case was an earnings report. We'll also see it from the Federal Reserve announcement will have, uh, you know, an effect on the S&P for the, you know, for about a week to two weeks often. Um, so earnings reports in whatever the gap might be, gaps are a great place because they, you know, show that sudden rapid revaluation in the supply and demand. And it catches a lot of people off guard. So they scramble and we've got initial volatility for a few days. It settles down. And now the true trend, I think, right here is now reversing higher. And this is where, you know, this is where it confirms to me 
that the buyers are back in control. We had this rally up. We had a, a higher low, a rally up, another higher low. And you could look at that and say, well, isn't that an ascending triangle? You can put all kinds of names on these things. But what we're looking at is supply and demand. We know for a fact that the buyers are back in control and this stock is now moving higher. So, you know, great example right there of a stock that's just moving out of this range today. Now, the most recent relevant higher low is right here. That's where I currently have my stop. Okay, I'm most I was, I was going to ask how, how tight to the VWAP will you keep your stop? Whereas if it, if it can't stay above the VWAP from the recent high or the gap up, you know, how much, how much wiggle room are you willing to give it? Well, so my initial uh, stop was actually right here. Okay. Pulled back. I held it. Didn't violate it. This morning we had some weakness and it rallied from there. So that's the most recent relevant higher low for the time frame I consider being involved, which is swing trade. Most likely, what, what I'm looking to do is to sell a third up here at 2650. If it breaks out, if it breaks that high, I'm going to sell a third of it. And then what I would be looking for is if it continues to go higher, I'll continue to hold two thirds. But now I'm going to raise my stop up under here. So I've reduced my risk in two ways. One, by taking a third off if it gets up there. And that basically takes my cost basis down by about, you know, so on a third, it, by 30, you know, by 33 cents, by 15 cents overall on the two thirds uh, balance. And then my stop goes from $24.12 up to $25 and, you know, whatever this is, 40 cents per share. And what I'd really be looking for here is now that if it breaks out, it will catch some people off guard and then pull back. And then I would most likely add that piece right here. And then as it moves higher again, raise my stop up underneath this higher low if it develops. It's all, you know, but that's what's going on in my mind is saying, you know, now we've got the trend. And if the trend continues, so at, for me as a swing trader, for an investor, you might just look at this and go, wow, that's an amazing chart. We're above the anchored volume weighted average price from the IPO and from the all time high. So we know as a fact, the buyers are in control. This stock might be headed, you know, who knows the, the weekly chart could, you know, start doing something like this. They've got good revenues. They've got good earnings. So it's all about whatever time frame you're engaged in as well. I stick to swing trades. That's what I'm most comfortable with. Gotcha. What are some other other stocks that you're in right now, and you can show us some VWAPs. I'm just going through some charts on my screen right now, looking for some stocks that were recently uh, rejected at their VWAP from the recent high. I think one- um, I've got a few of those. Actually, you know what? I just did that this morning. I posted this on, on Twitter. Here you've got, here's four of them. Hims. Oh yeah, yep. Highlight, IoT, and now Maxon is breaking. Um, okay. So this blue line is the year-to-date anchored volume weighted average price. So they're all kind of trying to find support at that year-to-date anchor, and they're doing what you know what I call a pinch. Their you know their energy is compressing between these. And what we want to see, like this HLIT, is a tight consolidation, because if we get a tight consolidation and break, or like in Hims, if it breaks, we can set our stop under here. If if IOT breaks above this level, now my stop has to go down here, which is at seventeen ten. And if it breaks, it's at 1950. So that's a dollar 40 risk versus if I buy it at 1420 here, my stop can reasonably go at 1370. So I can buy more shares with the same amount of risk based on, you know, again, the definition of trend and where the buyers regain control. Do you like do you like those pinches? I, I do like the pinches. I think that there's a lot of people that have read that chapter on pinches. And they show me, you know, a pinch and, you know, what they're, what they'll show me often is something like this, where it might be like this and they're like, Hey, it's about to break its pinch. And I'd say, you know, not yet look for it to compress. I, this is what I really like is a tight compression, not a big wide loose one, because if it breaks up here, one, it's short term extended. And then I have to put my stop way down here. Versus now we've got it kind of coiled up. And if I buy above this level, I can buy more shares because my risk is underneath this key level that's 
defending being defended by the year to date anchored VWAP right in here. We can put another, uh, we can anchor another one to this low right here for HIMS. And now you, now I might actually set my stop under that if I buy it above this level. And it right. all depends on, I want to be a buyer of strength. This market in particular, it's just really, I've got trust issues with it. It's, it's difficult yep. to, you know, hang on to things and, and you know, give them the, the benefit of the doubt because so many have failed. It is a very choppy market, tough to trade. I, I, you know, in my morning newsletter, I keep saying that this is a great market for getting your stop losses chewed up and spit out. You know, that just, Absolutely. that's what seems to happen. Um, how much trading will you do uh, if, the, if the indexes are not cooperating? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I I get that one a lot, and and that's something I learned years ago. Is that I would I, I would I would you know we'd have maybe a weak market environment, and I'd see a stock that I really liked, and I wouldn't buy it because the market is going down or whatever. And then I would watch that stock go without me, and I just got tired of that. So what I do is I you know my little mantra is each stock on its own merits. If the stock looks good, I'm gonna buy it. If I think I can control risk, but if we're in an environment where, you know, banks are falling apart, you know, two weeks ago when this real bad news is starting to come out and everything is losing a bid, I'm still going to buy it, but I'm going to buy, you know, a C list idea An a list idea is, you know, one full risk unit, a B list idea is a half of a risk unit, a C list idea, maybe 25 basis points, maybe 30 basis points of what my normal risk would be. But that's that's what the market gives me is, you know, how how hard should I press on the gas? What what gear are we in? How much exposure do you have on right now? As far as percentage of uh, account yeah, like, value? Well, yeah. How much how much of your overall portfolio is, is in the market? Probably about 12 percent. OK. Yeah. I mean, I just I'm at 15 right now. I was. Yeah. I was at zero coming into today. I've been at zero for the last week. <laughs> yeah. Finally, finally got into a few names today. Um, mo most of, uh, let me just look at the, the, the four that I'm in right now and just see what the VWAPs are doing. So the four I'm in right now are, let me just pull up my portfolio. So Lan Lanthius, L-N-T-H. I mean, I own this one in my investment portfolio. So yeah. yeah. You know, I've been in that one for over a year in my investment portfolio. So well, that, you know, that's a great uptrend there. I would put one oh, yeah. here to that. Was this an earnings report, Jonah? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that looks great. I mean, and it, you know, it accelerated here. So that's a handoff point. If you really wanted to be aggressive with, you know, part of your stop, you know, maybe underneath the most recent relevant higher low from that handoff point. So underneath this level is the way I would look at that. Okay. Uh, next one I got in today was first solar because it finally pulled back to the uh, 10 day moving average. So as it bounced off the 10 day, I started a position. Let's you know, do this. Stop loss about 1% below. It's funny because, you know, so, yeah. some of the solar names are acting really well right now. And then some of the solar names, the more speculative ones are getting are getting killed. Well, this MAXN is a solar name. actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and first solar looks phenomenal. It, it does. And, and and this was this is great to see. This is why I wait for strength, because, you know, this is this is where it looked like it should have been bought, not on the gap up, but after that recovery and then comes back in here. This was a nice little shakeout that, you know, shifted the supply and demand there. And now I would say, you know, if I was in this as a swing trade, I would anchor my VWAP here and say, now my stop is going to go underneath this level which is also the week to date volume weighted average price and close to that five day moving average. And I would take some off and probably put a, a you know, a third of my, you know, a third of my original position uh, stop underneath this higher low, because now it's accelerating again. That's as a swing trade, especially when I see the daily chart, you know, has had this big run. It's, you know, quadrupled since last summer. So it makes me a little nervous up here that we're just, you know, if it pulls back, it could pull back real hard. There's oh, nothing sure. suggesting it will, but we just, right. you know, that's what we see often. Uh, Uber, I got into, got finally got back in today. Uh, it bounced off the 100-day SMA yesterday, so I wanted to make sure that it held that level today. Got back above the 200 EMA, so I just started a small, small position, not even a, a you know, half of a regular size starter position. 
Yeah. I, so here's here's what I would look at is, you know, the most recent, uh, you know, high event was up here and then another one there. So it's starting to neutralize. So we have this pattern short term of lower highs and lower lows. Now we might be seeing a higher low. And then if it, you know, breaks here, then I think I think you're right. And then, you, you know, your worst case stop, I would say, you know, my worst case stop if I was in it would be underneath here. So it doesn't look like a high risk trade if if you know it depends on where you stop and what your time frame is um i noticed that it, it you know recently just came up to the anchored vwap from the covid low and got rejected there so if it were to head up towards that level i'd be looking at it saying maybe and that's also from the all-time yeah. high so here you know and that's also from the ipo <laughs> so there's there's a lot of price memory in that area so if it was to rally up there quickly, I would definitely be at taking least, profits. You, at least ratcheting my stops super tight up in there. Right, right. Because I mean, who knows? Maybe it gets up through that level and just leaves you in the dust, which is why I don't like to do price targets. I like to say, here's a level of interest on the upside. If it gets up there, maybe I'll sell a little bit, but more likely I'm just going to really switch to a shorter term time frame ratchet my stop up and really be close because if it, if it, you know, if it, what it often does is it'll break that level, get the breakout buyers to chase it after it just rallied from 30 to 39, right? So it just rallied 30%. The breakout chasers come in, they get sold into it, pulls back, they spit it out and then buy it on this next leg higher here. That's just, you know, the, the rhythm of the market. How do you screen for stocks? I, I'm old school, Joan. I just I, I have a large list of stocks that I look at on multiple time frames. Um, so each weekend I look at approximately a, you know, my, my list, my master list right now is about 900. And I, I don't expect to trade all those and, and it's not my intent to. But by looking at them manually, I get a really good feel for what the market's doing. I'll start to see things before the banks were rolling over. I'll start to see, hey, these stocks are stuck under their declining 20-day moving average. And I'll, you know, I'll note that and I'll see, hey, solar stocks are, you know, I've got three solar stocks on my list. You know, the, the, the uh, tan isn't breaking out yet, but these stocks might lead the way. So I get that down to about, you know, 200 or so that I look at each and every day uh, in the, in the, you know, at the end of the day, every single day. Okay. So I look at that and I try to anticipate, like I've shown here, here's what might happen for this type of stock. How would I want to be involved? And this would go on my list and say, all right, now I'm going to anticipate. I don't, I can't watch all these trades. So, you know, my list gets down to about 30 or so I'll go set probably 30 alerts, but the alerts don't mean I'm going to trade the stock. It means it's, it's truly just an alert. Some people think, hey, I set an alert there. I've got to buy it. It's just, hey, I haven't been watching this stock carefully today. It's at this level of interest that I previously noted. Now I've got to go take a closer look and get down to the nitty gritty and say, is the risk worth a reward here? What's the market doing overall? Is this an A-list idea? Um, speaking of A, I think that AI is also... Uh, potentially on on the verge of another move. The shorts, there's 29% of the float short. They just went from, uh, where is it? I just had it here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, they just went from 10% uh, of the float in January to 29.5% of the float. So in terms of number of shares, they went from 8 million to 25 million during this rally. Now the average price it's stock it's traded at in there. This is another way we can use the anchored view app. The average price since they added those 15 million shares is 23 and a half. So basically we can look at that and assume that on average they're down about two points or, or 10%. How do we feel when we're down in a short? We start to get nervous and we start to think, hey, maybe this stock is going to squeeze higher. So we look at the weekly time frame and say, is there the potential for something that, that, bigger. That is a wild chart. I can't believe the stock was 180 bucks at one point. I, I, I didn't see it back then. I had oh, no idea. Um, but here, you know, we're back above the anchored view app from this important breakdown point. So now we've, you know, we've we've rotated the psychology. It's it's you know, the ownership feels good about it on average for the last year and a half. 
for a while, if they, you know, as I always like to say, if they didn't scare you out on the way down from 180, they certainly wore you out. And now we're above the 10, 20, 30, 40 week moving average. The shorts are, are trying to hold this thing back. We've got this whole AI technology of, that's shifting the world right. at such a rapid speed right now. It's crazy, insane. I think, you know, we've got this stock now back above this anchored volume weighted average price in that peak, and it held the volume weighted average price from this low. If I was short this thing, I would be really nervous. So where would you look to buy it? Would you look for it to uh, pull back and bounce off one of those VWAPs? And then that's where you'd start your position? I actually bought some in here just earlier today, right in this area okay. with my stop under here. Okay. So I've, I I kind of am, you know, I, I don't have a full position, but I bought some calls on it and I bought a little bit of stock. I bought the calls just as a kind of, just in case they went out like uh, three weeks, I think I bought. Um and I bought a little bit of the stock. My, my intention is that I will likely sell the stock and hold the calls. So use the proceeds from the stock to uh, hold on to the calls. And, and where I'm looking to sell some is on a break above this level, because I think it does that. And then it pulls back and does this. And then I want to re-enter most likely with bigger size over here, because right now I have small size and some calls. How often do you do options? Um, not a lot. I mean, I, I do them, uh, you know, if they were a percentage of my trading overall, it might be about 5% of my trading. Okay. But I, uh, I do it to mainly to manage risk. You know, maybe the, sh maybe the shorts are right on this thing. I don't think they are. I think they got a lot of things, you know, against them, uh, including momentum. Uh, most important, including momentum um, and psychology of just what is this technology and what it's going to do for, you know, for humanity, really. Um, it's, it's just, we could go on a tangent about that for a while. I wonder um, what the short interest was when this was $150 stock. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. I can go back a year and the short interest, th this is this is higher than it was in April of last year. Uh, then they covered some down into here. And then now it's rallying. Uh, you know, they covered actually pretty steady. It was at 18 million shares in April of last year. They covered it down to 10 million here. Wow. But now I think they're making a big mistake of going back into the well again for uh, you know, trying to expect lightning to strike twice. I mean, there's so many of these long short funds now, you know, they have to constantly try to find these short ideas. So when they find a stock they think is overextended or a stock that they already made money on on the short side, uh, you know, I guess it's an easy target. I mean, Celsius has sort of been an easy target for the shorts for a while. You know, Celsius has had a pretty high short interest for the last couple of years just because it's had a, you know, it's had a big run. Yeah. And if you, if, if, if you anchor a VWAP to the all time high, you know, it was getting rejected, uh, I guess it was a couple months ago, you know, had a hard time getting through that that VWAP and then finally broke down uh, and then bounced off, as you can see here, bounced off of the VWAP from the the lows last year, the closing low of last year is where is where it actually yeah. bounced a few weeks ago. Yeah, I see ago. that right here off of this low. Yep. And then you've got from this peak right here, basically, that's this one. Oh, I didn't draw. Oh, that's this one right here. Basically kind of coming together in that same area. Right. And then, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, but if things got ugly, that would be the next level I would be interested in. Yeah, I hope I hope not. It's still my biggest position. <laughs> well, I know it's been a huge winner for you. You've been it has yep. a, a, a big winner for a while. I got in. I think my first purchase was right around twelve dollars. Yeah, so, amazing. That's great. Yeah. So right after this breakout. Yep, bought it in like April or May of twenty twenty. Nice. Right after, right after. I can't believe this was a three dollar stock during the. You know, the COVID lows, March 2020, I think the stock, it got down, I think, below $3. Uh, wow. Crazy. I mean, no one was buying it because no one even knew about Celsius back then. And if they had, they probably thought it was going out of business. So Yeah, $3.22 per share. Jesus. Wow. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't see not too many 30 baggers over the last three years. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, what's been your biggest winner over the last couple of years? I don't really have huge winners, uh, Jonah, I, because I, I trade and 
truthfully, in the last year, um, well, last year in particular, it was just a grinding year. Um, it There was nothing that stood out as a large winner. I can't think of one do, trade do you, that was a large Do you do any winner. shorting? What I would, yeah, I was doing both, but mainly okay. shorting. And and when I short, it's primarily. Um, so I I do I do ninety percent of my aggressive trading in my IRA, um, and and so in that case, what I do is I go to the inverse ETFs. Okay. You know, the the S triple Qs, the S O X S, um, you know those types of things. Yep. Um, so, you know, most of my trading is in my IRA because I don't want to deal with the wash sale, sale rule. I don't I don't want to designate myself as, you know, professional for that purpose. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think most people do it wrong. They, they look at their stocks in their IRA and say, well, that's for my long term. I don't care if it's down. It's like, well, you can't even get a tax loss benefit. If you're holding a loser in your IRA, I mean that, that that's good advice for anyone that wants to be a trader someday. Start contributing to your IRAs as early as you can. Yeah, always. And and once you get it built up, you know, through traditional strategies, and you have some abilities in the market to trade, that by far is where I do. Like I said, ninety percent of my active trading. Do VWAPs work with leveraged ETFs? That great question. I. Don't even look at the charts of the levered ETFs. Okay. You, if you, I'm going to buy you the, look at the underlying chart, like the if, you, yep. if you're going to use SQQQ to short the Nasdaq, you're gonna you're gonna follow QQQ, and if it's getting rejected, then you throw on your SQQQ. A hundred percent. You got it. Yeah. I I I don't look at the chart of the uh of the the triple because they you know the the, the math on them is, is just funky you know this right. it's the daily uh compounding or day what whatever it is the math is horrible on them so the charts get really screwed up they don't really show that truly what's going on um you know it's like charting an option right i mean because you've got decay every day right um so I, I, you can't... i've seen some of the 2x ones are a little bit closer but the 3x can be really off yeah, I, I just, you know, and just to keep it simple too, they're both liquid enough that they're going to, you know, if there's any discrepancy, you know, that that would be there, it's going to get arbed out. So it's going to be, um, that's a little AI company, by the way. I have a- uh, <laughs> I've never, I didn't recognize that. the ticker symbol, so. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a good looking chart, right? And you look at this weekly time frame, it, it's got some room to run and it's, it's, associated with AI, whether they actually do anything or if it's one of these companies <laughs> that, you know, put out a press release and said, we're doing AI. Right. <laughs> uh, so they get bid up. Um, I, so I, many companies I, right now are trying to get AI and chat GPT, you know, into their services, into their press releases as quickly as they can. Yeah. You know what the funny thing is too, Jonah, I don't know if you noticed this, as soon as that chat GTP came out, what was it in November? Now we've got you know, hundreds of AI sites. Oh yeah. And it's, you know, the, the thing is what, the, what I think they're doing is they're just using chat GPT, a, uh, API and creating something off them. It's not like everyone invented AI all at once. Right. Agreed. Um, so, you know, I think you, if you get a good handle on chat GPT, uh, you don't need all those other ones, but that's again, a different story. It doesn't really matter. Well, you see big company. I think Zoom Info said they're integrating Chat GPT and a bunch of other ones too. Uh, Z, uh, Z, uh, Zoom Zoom Info ZI. Yeah. Oh, well, this is oh Zoom Video ZI. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know there's too many too many Zooms. There are right. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a pretty broken looking stock. Yeah, I mean that that I mean I don't own it. That 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 company has its own problems. They've been. Missing numbers, as you can see from that big gap down. I think they they missed numbers and gave some pretty bad guidance for the year. You know, this is another stock that was up at 70, 80, 90, I think, during COVID. You know, now it's down 75, 80% from its all-time high. Yeah, just garbage. <laughs> yep. I mean, I, I assume it finds a bottom in there somewhere, but I'm not sure where. I mean, that's not the kind of stock that I'm looking to own either. Uh, when you are shorting, are you typically are you, are you using the indexes or use individual individual names. Yeah, I prefer the indexes, but I will sometimes go to individual stocks. Um, DOCU looks like maybe it could roll over. Um, BL is one I've had an eye on. 
for the same reasons. There's the anchored view app from the November low. And then, you know, it looked like, so it, it was actually on my list as a potential short for today, but it gapped up and ruined it. I was looking for it to do <laughs> something like this and then break down here and have my stop above this point. Um, and because we were, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, a fractal of this. We have this anchored view app and it got stuck below it. And then we have this anchored view app, which is this one, and it got stuck below it. So I was thinking, hey, another, you know, move lower because the weekly chart still is kind of ugly looking. So, you know, I, but I prefer the liquidity and the sanity of trading the index rather than, uh, you know, on the short side, rather than the individual stocks. So what's like, so that's interesting. So that, so that's the, the QQQs recently got rejected at the VWAP from the November 2021 all-time high. That's the all-time high there. And look at, I mean, it couldn't close above it here. Yep. It touched it there. It touched it last week. Wow. And this is the year to date anchored VWAP. So again, you know, what's going to happen here, I think, and this isn't a prediction, but the way I look at this market is we've just had a run from 280, you know, 290 to 320. To buy a breakout here, I think that people are going to get trapped. It's going to come down like this and maybe even do this. I mean, I'm not so bull. I'm not thinking that it's going to just all of a sudden be a new bull market. I think this market still has a lot of issues. It's trying to digest and it's, it's, you know, you've got to take it on a stock by stock basis. And, you know, I, fortunately for me, I don't have to have a macro theme because I don't trade a macro time frame. I'm aware of certain things and I'm most, mostly aware of, you know, when the Fed is going to announce or when a, a speaker is going to be out or when the uh, PCE on Friday is, you know, Friday morning, I, I, I need to be aware of those potential market moving catalyst. But, you know, as far as my macro theme, I don't have one. <laughs> Will you reduce exposure in your portfolio heading into one of these you know, CPI, PPI, CPE yes. jobs number sort of data dumps? Yes. In okay. particular, if, if the market has run up three or four days ahead of it. Right. Um, whereas if it's sold off a few days ahead of it and I've got a stock that I'm holding that's in a good position, um, I'll I'll generally cut it down to a third of my original piece. Um, I don't like the uncertainty of of the volatility. You know, I'm not trying to pick a direction. I you know of or, or you know figure out what the Fed's trying to do. Uh, you know, because we can't even we we don't even know what the market will. We don't know what they're going to do, and we don't know how the market's going to respond. So. Um, that's the most important thing. So I want to reduce my risk always in front of those potential catalysts. What's Sometimes that? I look at it and go, oh shit, I should have held some more, you know, and that's just human nature. Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's impossible not to have FOMO from time to time. Yeah. But you know, but that's part of a disciplined approach that you're going to feel those things, but you have to forego the woulda, shoulda, couldas in, because, you know, people only tend to remember the ones where they say, oh, I knew it. I should have done this or that. But if it went the other way, you know, it's crickets. They're, you know, they are holding big pieces and they're, you know, down 3% overnight. You know, that's that's soul crushing to me. I, I can't I can't experience that volatility. What's your perfect favorite setup? Like where you see it and you're just like, oh God, I I, I can't wait to start a position in this stock. Is it reclaim, you know, uh, uh, breaks out of that pinch? I mean, yeah, kind of, kind of. If, if okay. the pitch gets really tight in there and we've got a defined level of resistance that it breaks and a clear area to put my stop and it's supported on that weekly time frame and that daily time frame and there was a fundamental catalyst, I don't care necessarily what the catalyst was, but I like to look at it and say, hey, it was increased revenues and increased earnings. That's not why I buy stocks, but it is why a lot of people with big, big money buy stocks. And if they're going to be in there supporting this stock, I'm going to ride their wave because their confidence in holding this because they have a reason to justify their holding for it. Whereas I'm more skittish. I'm going to get out if the price start action starts moving. I can go revisit. Sometimes I'll miss a trade. I don't care at all if I miss a trade. It's just, you know, I've been doing it long enough that that part of FOMO, 
it, it doesn't motivate me. I get FOMO, but it doesn't motivate me. I, I, I look at it and go, oh, shit, shoulda, coulda, woulda. But it doesn't make me act and chase a stock and, and do dumb things with my money. I've done a lot of dumb things with my money. You know, <laughs> we since all have. <laughs> time in 1991. Do you typically prefer growth stocks, you know, stocks that have a little bit more beta to them over value stocks? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is a value stock? It's just a stock. It's a beaten down stock waiting to become a growth stock, right? <laughs> In, Intel wishes it could be a growth stock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's another one. If they didn't scare you out, they'll wear you out. And uh, for you know, real. It, it's, it's behaving well now and actually just up through its 200 day moving average, which I think is a trap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, broke this resistance, breaking the 200 day moving average, maybe runs a little bit, then I bet it comes back like this, shakes I, I, those people out. And maybe, you know, once that 200 day moving average begins to flatten out, and we get the 50 day and the 20 day and the 100 day to start looking like this, maybe there's something to Intel, but right now it's still, it's still broken. So I wonder how, I wonder if a stock like Intel is benefiting because the rest of semis are performing so well. And there's so much money going into ETFs that by default, you know, Intel being in the ETF, the semi the semiconductor ETFs, are they getting inflows just from that? You know, because they Nvidia, are. AMD, I mean, all yeah. the other semis look really good. And maybe Nvidia is just, you know, right riding that wave right now. Yeah, you know, I did a I I asked Chat GPT actually this morning, said, you know, what stocks, what, what stocks are directly um involved in ai and their list wasn't great i didn't think they just came up with uh um their list was nvidia alphabet ibm amazon microsoft tesla baidu intel and qualcomm i was oh. looking for more of the uh the smaller names <laughs> yeah for, <laughs> right. for the for the names that have some juice well but, well you, know, you, when you look you, at what, Nvidia. That that's had a ton of juice. Oh right? my god, it's it's up like it's up over hundred percent in the last few months. Yeah. Um, will you? I mean, like like you just said, Nvidia is a bigger name, but in terms of like the mega cap tech, you know, the the Fang stocks, will you trade them or they're just too big, not worth it? No, I will, and I actually bought some of this uh, Cisco, <laughs> which I I put a tweet out today. It's it's old and it's slow and it's boring. And, you know, here's what happens with these stocks typically. But it's very profitable. <laughs> it, it, so, you know, it's above the anchored VWAP from that high, right? We see how it fought it real hard. We're above the volume weighted average price from this low. And there's buyers at that. We're above the 10, 20, 30, 40 week moving average. We're go to the daily time frame. We're, you know, looking like we're, you know, this prior resistance holding support right at that 50 day moving average. And it's breaking higher. And with a stock under here, you can kind of, you know, it's slow and boring. You can kind of, I so I tell myself, well, I can kind of, you know, buy some of this and not really think about it. But as soon as I put it on, I start thinking about it. <laughs> and, you know, if it starts moving against me, I don't care what my macro theme is for the stock, that it's got this great looking weekly chart. Um, and it should do some, you know, probably run, it looks reasonable that it could come up to this level of prior support. That's clearly a level of interest. Now that's, you know, two, three, four points away. So it's not a big deal, but it's slow. So it's probably gonna take time to get there. Most likely I'll make, you know, 85 cents a share on this stock, get bored with it and kick it out. That's just my personality. Right, right. Um, oh God, I had a good question too and I forget what it was. Oh, any uh, any sectors that you stay away from? Do you do anything in biotech? I'm I'm highly skeptical of most biotech. Um, what I generally stay away from is anything commodity related. Okay. Um, you know, so like airlines, en energy. You won't touch, or are you talking like the energy Freeport McMorans? Yeah, no, ener energy. So I, I include airlines in, in the energy. I include shippers in energy because their, you know, their major cost is energy. And, you know, the problem with most commodity related stocks in my mind is there's two sets of supply and demand, one for the under underlying commodity and one for the stock. And I don't know what the hedging policy is, where they're hedged, where they begin to lose money or where it starts to help their bottom line. And, you know, you expect 
oil stocks to trade in the direction of oil or gold stocks to trade in the direction of gold, but it doesn't always work that way. Right. So it it's too confusing for me. I like it clean and simple. So even banks, I don't trade banks because I consider them a commodity related stock and the commodity is money and the cost of money. And, you know, the, all the variables that come with that and the global macro, you know, bullshit. So I'm looking more at, at growth type stocks is, is really where I do, again, probably 90 plus percent of my uh, trading. I can't remember the last time I actually owned a bank stock. Uh, do you- well, That's a good thing. Because <laughs> if it was recently, you'd remember. Oh, God. I know. <laughs> Do you, I mean, I know there are a lot of people trying to bottom fish in these regional banks right now. And I'm just, I'm afraid that even if I jumped into it, you know, I would pick the wrong day. And, you know, you get some news report about some bank in trouble and the whole sector trades down five or 10% the next day. And I don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Yeah. It's, it's not worth it to me. I've, no. that, doing that kind of stuff, you know, I, I've gotten this way you know, avoiding things like the, the regional banks, because I've tried it before and they've always been my biggest losers, you know, bottom fishing and stuff. So, you know, I learned it the hard way. That's, that's the only way I learned these market lessons. And fortunately I've, you know, got a strong discipline for risk management and uh, it didn't take a lot of those large losers to, to realize it over the years. Otherwise I still wouldn't be in this business. You typically hold into earnings, trim before earnings, or just stay clear of earnings? If I have a position that is really working well and it's had a recent pullback and I have some, then I'll hold it. But if it just ran 10% three days prior to earnings, I'm always going to sell it because how much better can it get? It's a buy the rumor, sell the news type thing. Um, I, I don't hold a lot of stocks in front of earnings. And when I do... It's typically, you know, just a, a, a small piece of what I originally had. And I've got a comfortable uh, um, cushion in it that if it gaps down 10%, then the overall position will still be profitable. I'm not going to put myself in a position where a binary event like earnings is going to cost me the profitability of a good trade. You look at fundamentals at all, or is it it's all about technicals? No, I, I do. I use, I use MarketSmith and... Okay. I, you know, to me, it's more about the psychology of the fundamentals, like I said earlier. So I'm looking for, you know, my fundamental analysis is two things. Are they selling more stuff? Or are they making more money selling that stuff? Whatever that stuff is, energy beverages, semiconductors. And you could actually argue that semiconductors are a commodity as well for a lot of yeah. oh, for sure. tech stocks. Um, so I guess that's my exception to commodity stocks. Um, so I want to know the psychology, what, what's motivating the biggest money on the planet who has to buy these growth stocks with the strong revenues and earnings, and they're going to continue to buy those. They're going to put on a three-month VWAP program and buy this stock because they have inflows every day and they have money they have to deploy. And these are their highest conviction names. So they just keep buying it on pullbacks to the to the VWAP from the earnings report or for the week to date or month to date, whatever. So it's more about the psychology, just like it is in technical analysis. I, I, I view a P.E. ratio almost identical to a moving average in that it's a, psych, it's a psychological piece of information that might motivate some people to take action. Maybe not a P.E. ratio, but it's, you know, it's a valuation measurement that will sometimes attract people to a stock, an increase in their dividend, whatever it may be. So um, it's, it's, it's always about the psychology, uh, you know, trying to figure out what's the psychology of the market and the participants, not my personal views of, hey, this is a good company. I don't know what a good company is. We get lied to every day. Oh, we by do. CEOs. I, was, I was bashing one CEO, uh, a stock that I own. I was bashing the CEO. My stock was from this morning because I just feel like he's been misleading investors and sounding a little bit too bullish and optimistic. And then they do a, you know, an, an offering today and catch us all off guard. Uh, in, in your book, do you have a favorite chapter in your book? Uh, that's a good question. No one's asked me that. I don't know. You know, the truth is, Joan, I, I put a lot of work into it and I, you know, did the editing. And in fact, I've got another editor looking at it right now, just for some really tiny things um, that, I hate the book right now. I can't look at it. And <laughs> really? Why is that? Uh, just because I've put so much time into it. And, and it, it, 
it's a love hate relationship. I, 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 I'm, I'm very proud of it, but I, I hate picking up and reading a word because it, because every <laughs> sentence that I wrote in there, I wrote it 10 times and edited it. And uh, I think though, that basically the, the key concept to understand is that it's about supply and demand and the objective measurement of supply and demand from a point of, of, of uh, you know, where the movement began, such as an earnings report. It's a hundred percent objective way of saying who's in control, buyers or sellers from this point. And then understanding the psychology of why. So the chapter on the institution that explains the institutional aspect of it, and then support and resistance and why it might be a place where support is found and how to act or not act based on how the stock responds to that anchored view up in that area. So it all comes, everything comes down to that VWAP as a level of interest. Does it in fact offer support and the stock begins to move away and I can buy the stock low risk and, and set my stop? Or does it you know, come down to that VWAP, hold it for a half a day and then just slice down through it? So that's the key to understanding really all of the other chapters. Last question here, uh, then I'll get, get uh, let you get back to your day. Do you like earnings season? Because it gives you some new anchor points for VWAPs. Yeah, 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 I, I do. I, I, you know, in fact, in in 91, when I started at Lehman Brothers, I was working as a, uh, a cold caller for a, a senior broker there. And I was really fortunate to work for him because he married fundamentals with technicals. And he would always do positive earnings surprises. And he would use that, at, you know, backed up with a chart. And that was my first really foray into making real money with stocks and watching it happen right in front of me. So I gravitated more towards technicals, obviously, um, but it's always in the back of my head. Are they selling more stuff? Are they making more money doing that? And how is that going to motivate all these growth funds to compete for that stock? Because this is one of the best, best growth stories out there. They need to own it in their portfolio, otherwise they're going to fall behind. They're going to look stupid. Their investors are going to question them and pull money away unless you're one particular fund where they just seem to reward failure. I was just going to say, I mean, they'll <laughs> they'll just dollar they'll dollar cost average all the way down to zero. Yeah, and I, I, I think they, I they pretty much have. <laughs> but I'll give a subliminal. I'll give a subliminal message. Here, we'll just put the chart up, and people can see the symbol. <laughs> <laughs> in full disclosure, I, I own some SARC right now, which is the inverse uh, ARKK ETF. It's sort of a hedge. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I, 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 you know, it was on my list as a, a potential short today, but obviously the market uh, didn't agree with that right away. So uh, I was looking to get involved in it because it was looking like it was breaking higher here um, instead of gap down. But, you know, it's a hedge, as you said. So uh, yeah, I've only been in it for three days, I think, three or four days. I bought it at, uh, I bought Sark at 41. Oh, okay. Uh, some, someday last week. Nice. So I tip it. Uh, let me just. Did so you I might up? have, oh, yeah, oh. I, I, mean, I might reduce it. I mean, it, it all depends on what the indexes are doing. Um, you know, I said if the SPY closed above the 200 day EMA today, I would probably reduce my exposure to Sark. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a 15% hedge right now. It's not, not that big. Yeah. I mean, that thing does, you know, that, that's ARC ETF can move pretty quickly. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be on the wrong side of it for too long. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I know you're not a big fan of her. Strategy. I wonder if they use VWAPs at all. <laughs> Probably not. You know, if they did, it, I think the performance would be a little bit better. And, and right. it, it's not that I'm a fan, not a fan. It, it's, it's, I'm not a fan of everything over here. That just a complete failure of risk management. That's, that's what I'm not a fan of. Over here, great. You know, you deserve the success. But were you lucky in a bull market and you just gave it all away? Right. You know, that's just irresponsible. That's that's the problem there. 
I mean, it is tricky when you're running that much money, you know, like you said, I mean, getting, getting in and out of positions of that size can be hard, but maybe she shouldn't have had positions that big in speculative companies in the first place. Yeah. Or trim them on the way up. I mean, yeah, it's, you know what, it's, I'm glad I don't have her job. She has, lives in a bigger house and have a bigger bank account than me, but I can't imagine the stress. Oh my God. The I... Constant hate that she gets. It's, you know, so I, I try to understand that part, but I, it, truthfully, the lack of risk management just disgusts me. You do anything with, uh, with crypto, Bitcoin, does, does, do VWAPs work on crypto? Absolutely does. We're, you know, bumping up against the anchored VWAP from the all-time high on crypto right now. Um, Interesting. I haven't, I closed, I, I didn't close my account, but I took uh, 95% of my money out of crypto about six or six or seven months ago when um, the first exchanges were starting to fail. And oh, I figured, like you know, F there's, FTX. there's a lot of, there was a lot of, you know, issues here. Now I hear Binance today is, you know, the, the latest one. So I've completely missed this recent rally. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, I've, you know, I, I missed Riot today. That was uh, one I was looking at as, as a potential uh, trade, but it gapped up. You know, this was a nice little pullback to the anchored VWAP from this low. And then when you look at the 15 minute time frame, you know, it was it was showing signs that, you know, these lower highs and lower lows were maybe getting ready for a move. It got it was a C list idea. So no big deal. I missed it. Do you do you break down like do you actually write down your ideas? This is an A list, B list, C list? I do. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian, so much. Really appreciate it. And once again, thank you for being a speaker at my two conferences. Yeah, thanks for having me. I don't think I'm going to do any more of them because it's a lot of work. I don't blame (laughs) you. It's like writing a book. I'm glad you were there uh, for both of them. So thank you very much. And congratulations on the book. Uh, I'm not quite done with it yet, but we will send a free copy to at least one person, uh, you know, who watches this interview and helps share it online. So uh, awesome. Any any closing words? I know a lot of people can find you on Twitter at yeah. Alpha Trends. Where else can they find you? You know, Twitter is the best place because anything that I put out there, I put it on Twitter. So I, that's kind of like the main aggregator of anything I put other places. So Twitter, Alpha Trends. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, talk to you soon. Okay, sounds good. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.